<laughs> well, hello and welcome to the Psychedelic Diaries. I am your host, Ray Krishna. Mm. We have a show for you today. As usual, we will start with the nugget and the noodle. We have a special guest, Peter Raitano, the CEO and founder of Guella Mushroom. He'll be here for a deep dive and a soul search. Producer Kevin is here. And please subscribe to the show because he and I are busting our asses to try to bring you good content. So without further ado, let's get started with the nugget and the noodle. Speechless in Seattle. Seattle has now decriminalized magic mushrooms and has become the biggest city to do so. And sometimes there are no words, but I will say this, congrats to Seattle and thank you. Between Oregon's trailblazing legislation, the state of Washington's DEA lawsuit, and now this, the Pacific Northwest is really lighting up the scoreboard. And as for the noodle, something I've been noodling on of late, magic mushroom training wheels. So how do we get people ramped up to legal full dose sessions on magic mushrooms on their own. So some people after a first couple sessions with a guide will no longer need a guide. Other people like myself will simply prefer at times to do a trip alone because it brings certain nuance. So what would that look like? Maybe it's a micro dose session to warm up. Maybe it's a couple sessions with a guide and then you graduate to be able to do it on your own. Or perhaps there's a standardized at home prep or integration protocol, which then leads to the training wheels coming off, offering everybody access to explore full dose magic mushrooms on their terms. Something to noodle on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I may direct your attention, he is the CEO and founder of Guella, Peter Raytano. Thank you for joining the show. Pleasure to be here. Okay, well, let's dive right in. Peter, uh, I've used the Mojo gummies now the past few weeks, and I got to say, I have felt fantastic. And I was actually a little bit skeptical, you know, another nutraceutical, but wow, talk about getting into a flow state. Congrats on the release. I think you have a new okay. version coming out. It's a great product, slick design, and I'm curious for you, how would you describe Mojo and what is a non-psychedelic microdose? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so Mojo is our kind of flagship product, super proud of it. It's been 10 years in development with our science team. Um, you know, our chief science officer, Daniel, he's been working on it for a long time. Um, the idea really came from like, how do we mimic some of those benefits and effects that people get from microdosing, you know, or low dosing psilocybin in a legal platform using different bioactives that are widely available, combining them in a stack to get those results. And when we look at what the benefits are and what people report from microdosing, it's often things like you know, mood modulation, focus, creativity, a little bit of kind of energy boost. And so we worked back from those, um, those, those effects and those benefits, looked at what other nootropics, uh, herbs, roots could achieve some of those results and then stack them together in, in, in one form factor, which is our, our tasty gummy. So um, essentially what it does is it, it, it mimics the effects. It's kind of pharmacologically mimics those effects to give you all of those, uh, you know, mood boosting, focus inducing um, good times. So we call it kind of flow state. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a kick in the face like Red Bull. It's not, you know, that, that kind of hero moment. You know, I want an extreme energy boost. It's a lot more subtle and mellow than that. It's in the, sh in the moment, there's this kind of flow state optimization, this kind of feeling of productivity and, and creativity. And over time, there's compounding effects through some of the um, ingredients in the formulation as well. So, you know, increased kind of neurogenesis and things like that. So super proud of it. It's coming out in or re-releasing it in two weeks with a new improved formula. Uh, we, we got rid of a bunch of the kind of sugar. Uh, we've made it vegan. We've improved the taste, but all of the bioactives that you've tried are exactly the same. Fantastic. Yeah. I, smooth lift off smooth landing. And I had forgotten that I was even on it. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I am locked in right now. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah, I took the mojo. So congrats on that. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. And a big, a, a big thing was like, how do we, how do we give people a, a, a boost of energy without that coffee crash that we all experience? I'm sure like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. So how do we smooth ride that out? How do we have a nice lift off, smooth ride it out. So we get productivity all the way through. Yeah. Maybe the gummy 
part of that actually adds to that smoother processing. Mm-hmm. So Peter, a, a couple of quotes of yours that I really loved. One, as you said, I wanted to create a company that helped improve access in a non-clinic setting. And you said, the biggest addressable market will actually be driven by self-improvement in a non-clinical setting. And right now, the big money, the big news is all with these biotech companies, and God bless them for doing good work. But on this note, you and I are really birds of a feather. And I'm curious for you, what do you see as the best path to bring legal psychedelic use for healthy people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I looked around two years ago. I was super interested in the psychedelic space, got a lot of experience in it. I wanted to build a company in this space. And, you know, I really saw two models popping up. There was, you know, biotech, drug development and kind of clinics, um, you know, first off ketamine clinics, but obviously there's these expansion capabilities, but all underneath this banner of medicalization, what can we use and what can we, how can we take these substances naturally, natural or synthetic and apply them to fixing, you know, serious disorders. And whilst I thought that was amazing, we're going to see a revolution in kind of mental health care from this, in my opinion, um, and the scientists are doing amazing work. A lot of companies are doing amazing work. I just fundamentally believe that that was the thin end of the wedge, that, that there was more mm. to these substances than fixing disorders. Um, historically, that's not how they've been used. You know, I like to say people didn't go to Eleusis to fix a cluster headache. They went to transform <laughs> and have profound life-changing experiences. And that's how, you know, most people interact with these substances. That's how most people I know interact with them. They, they take them to, you know, have a sense of, you know, explore their consciousness, have, a, have an amazing experience, whatever it is. And so I want to build a company that, you know, help recontextualize and reaffirm these things as tools to create, not just drugs to fix and cure. Um, and so that's what Guella's mission is. Um, we want to improve access, you know, enable people to use these substances, you know, safely, responsibly, um, intentionally, but outside of just, you know, the clinical system, this kind of Western clinical modality. Um, you know, I like to think of it as somewhere in between, you know, there's sitting in a doctor's chair under a fluorescent light um, and going out to the woods with your buddies and rolling the dice. Um, you know, somewhere in the middle is where Guella operates, where we're trying to build tools to enable people to you know get the most out of them in a safe and effective way but you know not just for fixing a disorder and not having to go to just you know the pharmaceutical or clinical route how do we do that well i think we're you know we're making great strides already like you you mentioned that the the top of the top of the show uh seattle decriminalizing i think we're going to see a progressive kind of uh zeitgeist shift across the US, Canada, Europe, uh, where we'll see kind of cultural moments that open things up. You know, we're seeing, it seems like daily, we're seeing a new celebrity come out and say, hey, I had an ayahuasca trip, you know, Will Smith the other day on GQ. You know, we're continually seeing these kind of moments where people are, you know, talking about these experiences that changed their lives. I think that helps the kind of coverage in the New York Times, all of these kind of cultural, um, cultural things kind of popping up. And we'll start to see more and more decriminalization and more and more liberalization. Um, and obviously there's a bunch of on the ground movements. We're seeing top down movements from pharma companies putting pressure on for you know, what they want to do. And so, um, you know, we just have to keep banging that drum. We have to keep banging yes. the drum of, um, you know, people should have access to these tools and um, the absolute hubris of governments thinking that they can make plants illegal is outrageous in 2021. And so, um, you know, we have to keep on with that message. And I think um, as we see a different demographic, you know, shift up with different views and, you know, more open mind about this thing, we'll see policies around the world change. Well put. And I totally agree. I think the key word is access. You guys have highlighted that. And that is going to be the the key path here. And I love that Ulysses reference. For those that don't know, that was what the uh, some of our brightest leaders that led to the Enlightenment in Greece in 500 BC or in uh, uh, early antiquity in Rome, they would do the mysteries. They would go take psychedelics in Ulysses and be awakened. And you're right, it was not for cluster headaches. It was to be awakened for spiritual purpose. So I love that reference. Peter, you have cut your teeth in cannabis. You are no stranger to a uncertain, obscure industry. 
What do you see as some of the lessons you can take from the cannabis industry and apply here in psychedelics? Hmm. Um, yeah, great question. I mean, in some ways, some of the you know business building components are the same across any vertical. You know, building a business is 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 hard, and you know a lot of the lessons I learned from building you know, product type businesses before certainly a big one was focus. I mean, my cannabis company. Um, you know, to start with, like we're going to have seven or eight products. We're going to release them in tandem. We're going to have a vape, a pre-roll, you know, tinctures and gummies. And you know, it ended up taking us two years to get one product out, and we spun our <laughs> wheels a lot. So definitely, kind of pick a, an entry point and and get a beachhead. Whether that's you know, in cannabis world, that you know, let's let's dominate some pre-rolls, and then we can expand out, make the consumer love our product, all of that kind of good stuff. But there are obviously nuances to running a business in highly regulated spaces um you can't market in the same way you have to get extremely creative about how you market you kind of miss you still can't use facebook google instagram you know there's only really a few platforms like snapchat twitter where you can kind of run ads um so you know you've got to get creative on the marketing side you've got to really start at the fundamentals um so in in consumer products it's you know who's my consumer um, how can we please them? How do we build a product that they love? How do we build a product that a hundred people, you know, adore rather than, you know, 10,000 people kind of think, eh, it's all right. Um, and, you know, ultimately you have to be flexible because you, you, you're building a business in a, in a shifting environment. Um, you know, regulations constantly change here in Canada on, on, the, on the marketing side for cannabis. In the US, obviously psychedelics are in their, you know, somewhat of their first inning. We're seeing kind of states, pop online but you know if you're building your business around just selling psilocybin to consumers you know who knows what's when that's going to happen um and so you know a big part of what we're doing at Guella is thinking about what are these ancillary tools what how can we be useful to people that actually consume psychedelics or are interested in consuming psychedelics how can we build these support tools how can we build bridge products like mojo in the now that can you know educate and improve people's lives but build kind of start building a space that where people are kind of ready for you know psilocybin coming into that or you know whatever it is so you know an element of flexibility is 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 definitely needed and kind of you know the ability to pivot um quickly and take advantage of opportunities so you know mojo is built to like i said educating people about microdosing be a bridge product be you know really effective by itself um, but then take advantage of states coming online when, when we can sell nutraceutical um, psilocybin as, as microdoses, we can add them into our stack. I mean, the stack was designed eventually to have psilocybin in there. So, you know, we'll have a brand ready that's driving sales that consumers like, ready to kind of integrate in with these substances when they come online. I love that. And I totally agree. It's flexibility, it's adaptability when you're in an uncertain market. So let's take that a step further. Let's say the dream happens and we get full legalization, whether it's US, worldwide, whatever it is, it's legal. We can buy it at dispensaries or however that infrastructure looks. When we get to legalization, if we get there, what would Guella do? How would you approach the market? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, first off, like we're, we're clearly interested in, in microdosing. So we're, you know, we're, we're doing research and we're building stacks up where we can sell the most effective nutraceutical versions of these products. Um, how would we approach it? You know, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, we want to be very laser focused on consumers and the people that actually use these substances. Um, you know, what do they find valuable? Who are these people? What do they need? What do they like? So as part of the company, um, we've, we built a tool called Capture um, that essentially looks at experiences and conversations and data online, gathers intelligence on how people are using psychedelics, you know, in what form factor, um, what are they buying, what strains are they buying, Golden Teacher, Penis MV, how are they taking it, um, is it a good or a bad effect, we're kind of extrapolating all that information so that we can build up an experience bank. First off, we, we kind of get a sense for all of that market intelligence, you know, how people are actually interacting with these substances, because it's you know, somewhat obfuscated, obviously, because of sure. you know, legal, legal barriers. You don't have a headset like in cannabis in the psychedelics world. But also we know what people want and what experiences are working for people. We have a vast data set where, you know, people can come to our, our website and 
plan their trip and kind of explore what's working out there and what are the good providers, what are the bad providers, all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, we're building tools that, again, all ladder up to that mission of, you know, how do we help people that want to have these experiences? What are the support tools people use? You know, whether it's uh, a product like Mojo or whether it's a data kind of trip planning tool or whether it's educational content, that's how we're approaching it. You know, we're, we, we just care about, you know, those people. I think, I think one of the problems in, in cannabis in Canada was this kind of, um, this obsession with elevating the brand. So we, we kind of, a lot of the brands <laughs> early on in Canada were, you know, elevated out of the stratosphere to the point where it didn't appeal to people that actually smoke cannabis. Um, and, you know, there was this all, all this talk of this kind of kind of curious demographic, oh, we're going to see, you know, the soccer moms come online, they're going to switch from Riesling and they're going to start smoking weed instead. And, and none of that really panned out and the same people that were smoking weed still kind of smoke weed. There's definitely been a growth, but it's not been what people were talking about. And a lot of the early brands created brands for this new audience that just doesn't exist. And mm. so they're appealing to people that, you know, you know, fictional marketing, marketing plans. And so we're now seeing a regression back in Canada of like brands trying to reappeal to the actual consumers, the people who are actually out there smoking weed, trying cultivars, whatever it is. Um, and so that's what we're thinking with, with psychedelics as well as a community out there that's, you know, very into this, they, you know, they're, they, they're, they're passionate about it, they're knowledgeable about it. Um, and we want to, you know, appeal to them, we want to provide tools to them, but we also want to, you know, provide tools to the people that are, you know, interested in the space, maybe nervous about the space, maybe don't know how to get into the space. And how do we how, how do we support their journey as well? That's fantastic. Well put. And I love this concept of focus. As one of my old mentors used to say, if you have many focuses, you have no focus. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And I think what you guys are doing, this widespread intentional use concept, that's when I first saw your website. I was like, yes, these guys get it. And why I brought you on. Uh, thank you for joining, obviously. And I brought Erin Cochran, your head of product on. She is, mm -hmm. by the way, lovely. You got a good team. And I'm curious, switching gears a little bit to you personally. This idea of widespread intentional use of magic mushrooms or psychedelics. For me, I had some recreational experiences that I think really opened me up to now being more of an intentional user. I'm thankful for those experiences. And I don't think recreational experiences should be demonized at all because I was 18, 19 when I first tried it. And uh, you are a mushroom nerd, as you said. And personally, I've been growing lion's mane mushroom and uh, <clears throat> some other mycelium of late but for you peter as you look at the full scope of your journey on psychedelics what are three highlights mm. i mean the biggest one for me has to be when i when i first encountered them i mean you know in the uk growing up um psych uh, psilocybin was legal you could go into a store and you could you could buy a pouch of non-dried uh mushrooms really from a head shop from a head shop essentially so and there was a brief window of time where you could do this the uk has had historically had this really interesting kind of relationship with um various different types of drugs and legal highs and things like that they were, they were quite accessible when we were younger and psilocybin you know we we tried weed uh, big fans you know around the 15 16 mark got into music all that kind of usual stuff um tried weed and then the kind of the next um, the next kind of stage for us was okay. Let's let's see what these psychedelics are. Um, and we, uh, you'd go in and buy these pouches from the head shop, and they were, I wish I knew the weight, but they were significant doses. Um, so we would, you know, go into the woods, take them, and we would have nine, eight, nine hour long um, trips. And you know, I remember the first time very distinctly um, going out there. One of my friends had already tried them. Um, I was with two other friends and I, I ate them, felt the usual nausea, but then at about the 40, 45 minute mark, I had that rush of euphoria, that love. And I'd never taken any other type of drugs before. So there was no like, you know, MDMA reference or anything like that, but that sure. was purely a kind of, you know, an MDMA style rush that I felt this kind of pure, pure empathy and love. And I remember walking off from my friend's um, kind of touching the leaves and just rolling about in the in the grass. This was in my in a forest near my village where I grew up, which is very everything you'd imagine about an English countryside kind of Jane Austen, you know, rolling hills. Um, 
And it's funny that the thing that I remember most from that trip was just thinking like, oh man, I need to tell people about this. This is incredible. What, like more people need to know about this like feeling. And the first person I wanted to call was my mum. So I tried to get my like Nokia 3210 or whatever it was out and like <laughs> di dialing my mum. And thankfully my friend that had done it before stopped me from calling my mum high on mushrooms. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I desperately wanted to tell people. And then, you know, all of the rest of the trip was visualizations, looking at things, you know, being intrigued by things, sensory, drinking water, kind of like, it blew my mind that this level of consciousness existed. I just, it, there was no frame of reference for me and that feeling of love. I do also remember though, having like distinct periods of anxiety, um, no, I would say mild kind of terror, um, no tools to deal with it, um, you know, anxiety coming off it. Uh, so, and I actually have that with most of my trips. I tend to have like a, you know, a, a, a sine wave of experiences. It's never like this is completely bliss or this is completely terrible. It, it's generally a bit of a mix. But now I've got tools to deal with that that mix. At the time, I, I really didn't. But the overwhelming, um, the overwhelming kind of feeling was this was incredible. I need to tell people. I never knew this this existed. Um, and, you know what's next kind of thing. And then, you know, I, you know, that was the, the first trip gone. Go ahead, please. No, I was going to say, and on the, on the second, on the second or third trip, I think, um, and this is all still aside, but we didn't have anything else really. Um, acid and things like that came a lot later. Um, but I remember on the second or third trip, I remember having a, a, a very transformational experience where and this is a lot for a 16 year old, I think, but like it was, it was, you know, I, I could be a little bit of a douche when I was younger, um, quite <laughs> arrogant. Um, and I wouldn't say I wasn't a bully. Uh, my friends and I weren't bullies, but we smart ass. Be, yeah. Smart ass cocky. I could be quite mean. I think, I don't think looking back, I wasn't proud over, you know, if somebody was being piled on um, in school, I certainly wasn't the guy to come over and be like, yo, stop, we should protect this, you know, <laughs> other human. I was, I was there kind of joining in with that, that stuff, you know, largely to fit in, but also, you know, I, I probably enjoyed being a bit mean. Um, and I remember one experience, um, tripping where I literally felt the, the, the nastiness that I was projecting on other people. I felt mm. it like I could, I was throwing it at people in my trip and I was feeling it right back. So it's like, I was the victim of my own bullying. And wow. um, I, I distinctly remember coming out of that and, you know, thinking about how I behave with people like on the school bus or whatever it is like, Oh man, I can be a, I can be a complete jerk. Um, and so, like, you know, I wouldn't say I'm completely rid of that, you know, ego driven, <laughs> like that's like side. Um, but it definitely helped um, frame it, contextualize it and, and help me improve it. And I can only imagine if I had, you know, the tools now that I did then like to integrate that experience a little bit more and think about it and maybe, you know, have a, have a series and kind of reflect on it. Like that also blew my mind is the ability to um, kind of get in different mind frames and reflect on it profoundly not just it's one thing to know like intellectually I can be a bit of a dick but it's another thing to kind of feel that dickish behavior and that kind of that 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 negativity and so um you know I really did see the potential for for change personal change you know yeah. I wouldn't say at 16 I was like you know this is going to revolutionize the mental health industry in 20 years but I I saw like oh I can I can evolve that's interesting and it, it was at the same time as you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of 16, 17 year olds are like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm interested in Buddhism and things like that. You know, all of that kind of stuff starts like rocking around in your head. You're trying to um, build the character that you'll eventually become. And I, I, just, I recognized in psychedelics this ability to, to evolve me. Peter, that that is beautiful. Thank you for that share. And um, I also appreciate the mention of some mild terror. And you also did not use a, a word uh, that I, I think we should get rid of or a phrase bad trip. I, I'm of the belief that there are no bad trips. There are deep cleanings or mm -hmm. there are mirrors that get held up right in front of you. And sometimes it's not pleasant. It's like, if you go to the, if you don't go to the dentist for 10 years, it's going to hurt. If yeah. you don't clean the house for three years, it's going to, you're going to have to really roll up the sleeves. And I think the same thing applies with psychedelics. 
And that idea of feeling your own bullying as it, as it kind of boomeranged back at you, I think that does get to the crux of what this can do for society and can do for the world really, where you start to see your own impact and the world you're creating and the, and the, the effect your words have. And one other thought, as you said, you know, it's still maybe a little bit of a dick at times. I, I am too. And I think at the end of the day, there are times where you need to be disagreeable. And um, so I appreciate that share. I think, I don't know how many good stories like that you have in the well, but my next question is, is a little bit more of the profound experience or maybe the mystical experience. Uh, I had one, Peter, where it was a blue light and it was this blue ultralight beam where it was everything and it was nothing. It, it was all of existence somehow, this, this blue light. And I, I saw it, I was aware of it, but I also was the blue light. And as I emerged from that experience, I remember thinking that was Nirvana. I, mm. I felt it and I understand it. And um, it, it's tough to describe, obviously these things are ineffable, but I felt like I understood oneness of the universe and this non-duality. And to this day, that feeling, that sensation of being that blue light and seeing the vastness, the impossible vastness of it, but at the same time being it, it's, it affects me still to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious for you, what's a, a transcendent profound experience that, that you can share? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, it's, you know, I've, I've definitely had touches of, of that, um, in, in my kind of psychedelic experiences. I, I do remember there was one weird trip that actually it wasn't, wasn't the best. It was probably more down than up for me, but there was, there was a couple of moments that I reflect back on. And one, I went to the, to the bathroom and looked at myself, which we all know probably not the best idea, but I remember <laughs> like having this visualization of um, me as, I don't know if you remember in the chemistry books, there was like this, um, diagram of an atom there's like an atom inside and then there's kind of different levels of course of it or whatever and I remember seeing like deflating down to me as an atom and feeling like pain and angst and then inflating back up to like the fullness it was it was super weird I haven't I've never been able to put my finger on it but it was like it was clear that I was like you're alone you're together you're alone you're together it was like this weird like heartbeat of like showing me where paradox I, like, the, yeah the paradox of it all it was it was it was it was weird and scary and but I reflect back on that like um yeah it was it was it was quite moving I mean I, not to get like too you know woo woo about things but I, I generally genuinely think that um you know one of the things we've done over the last 200 years is we've kind of denuded religion and the kind of sacred for for you know, value, you know, valid reasons. There's a lot, a lot of wrong with kind of organized religion. And, uh, you know, when Nietzsche declared God is dead and we kind of kicked the legs out of our kind of meaning system in the West, we did that for a reason, but we haven't really kind of come to terms with replacing it with any kind of real uh, system of meaning or um, replaced it with uh, kind of the, these, these things that we, we as humans need and what what i'm i'm convinced one of the things we all need is a you know profundity and all we're not built to just kind of drudgingly kind of go through life without you know any of those kind of things um going on and i i, I think you know psychedelics offers a path for people to have some kind of secular transcendental experience where they can inject awe and power into their lives um you know we can kind of reject all of the dogma of religion and kind of lean into these kind of transformative sides without like like I said being carried away with um the the rest of this stuff that we rejected for for good reason um and I'm not saying psychedelics are going to be a, a new religion or anything like that or you know but it it, it definitely is could a be. tool could it, be a tool it, for spirituality I, I think it is a tool for spirituality. It's a tool. It's a lever that we can pull to inject that much needed sense of awe and connectivity. Yes. You know, I think when I think about 
two major problems that we that we have in society we're kind of on one end um you know we're we're hyper atomized we're disconnected we're you know we're, we live in an individualistic kind of society for, in, in in some ways that's that's great um but in other ways you know it, it we, we don't have the communities that we once had we don't have these kind of connection points we're more tribalistic politically than we ever have been we've got social media kind of dividing us and you know one of the things psychedelics can do is increase empathy and your feeling of being part of a whole and so you know i think that that's one thing that psychedelics can definitely help with these big kind of existential questions and then another one is obviously you know we're contending with um you know major um climate issues and kind of environmental degradation um, and we really have no way of shocking people out of their malaise. Uh, you know, we're all the same. We don't recycle enough. We don't, you know, we don't consume. We know we should be consuming better. We don't. We probably, you know, most people know they they want to buy like I don't know, farm raised eggs, but they go for the cheaper option. Like we 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 don't make these right decisions. But one of the things psychedelics can do as well is you know, cr create this kind of sense of biophilia, uh, connection to nature, love for nature, and so. You know, I, there there are, there are obviously other routes to this. You know, but there that these are like catalytic tools that can get people there a lot faster. You know, sure. I think me meditation and breathing is a great tool for kind of you know having a sense of connectedness and you know altering your state of consciousness. But you know, can we afford people, um, you know, needing fifteen years to get to that place? Um, you know, you know, psychedel it psychedelics is like a shortcut almost. It's, I really like what you just said in this biophilia term. I haven't heard that before, but I, I know where you're going with that. And I think when you get two people that have gone through the experience and they see what it can do to your, to yourself, to your own sense of purpose and empathy, you can also start to see the impact it could have on the species, on the mm -hmm. globe. And it's like, there's no upper bound to what is possible. If we have a, a many people that are adopting these substances, having these experiences and feeling this connection to the whole so Peter, that was brilliantly put. Thank you for that. We got to switch over to the soul search. Okay, question number one, Peter, what is a current challenge that you're wrestling with? Mm. How to get my uh, seven month old baby to, to sleep through the night. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you solve that one, you're really gonna be a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> okay, question number two, Peter, who is the one person that's had the greatest impact on your career? Uh, Mark Williamson. Um, he took yeah. the time to, to to walk me through a plan. He didn't have to put that plan together, um, but he, he, you know, he did, and it, it was. But it was somebody taking the time, being like, "Oh, you can do better." And this the wake up call, kind of like a shock for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great call out, Mark Williamson. Yeah, that type of stuff. It's hard to give hard hitting feedback, and for him to do that, that's that's a great share. Thank you for that. Um, okay, question number three, Peter. This one will take some imagination, but Peter from the year 2031 is all of a sudden zapped into today. So future Peter from 10 years into the future is here. In 10 seconds or less, what do you think he would tell you? Um, <laughs> they were a little mad. Um, they were eating like shit. They were not very nice to each other. But there's some cool stuff too. So I dig the music of your time, um, but <laughs> not not your diet is probably what I'd say. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's really good. I and I'm with you. I think we are in the golden age of music right now. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Okay, question number four. Last one, maybe the hardest one, but imagine you're walking down the street, turn around the corner, and you pop into a bar. You want to wet your beak, pull up a chair, and there sitting next to you is God. And he says, hey, Peter, good to see you. Big fan. I got to run. I got this hot date with a goddess down the street. I have time for one question, though. What is the one question you would ask God? What is the one question I would ask God? Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Duck Bill Platypuses. Why? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Uh... That would be something incredibly profound and in I'm sure that I would want to, you know, I would want to dig into, but, um, uh, you know, how do I get on my guest list to, to heaven? Maybe. That's a good one. 
That's there. a good one. What is coming up for Guella? Where can people find you? And is there an action item for the viewers and listeners? Yeah, yeah. Um, lots going on with Guella. Uh, Mojo is being released in two weeks. If you go to mojo.shop, um, there is a discount code of 20% that you can sign up for um, as, a, as a pre-launch. Um, so that's going live. Uh, we've got a, a podcast called Super Psychedelic that we're launching in a month's time that's super excited about. And we've just got a bunch of kind of these cool little content support tools. So you can find all of that at guellamushrooms.com. You can sign up for our newsletter and uh, stay up to date. But uh, the big thing is look out for Mojo. Peter, you have been a fantastic guest. He is the CEO and founder of Guella Mushroom. Well, that is it for today's episode of the Psychedelic Diaries. Thank you to Peter Raitano, producer Kevin, and Ray Christian. See you next time. That's it, friend.